name is Jessica Crow, and I'm the founder of Apogee and the host of Change Leader Insights, which is a podcast all about change, leadership, growth, human performance, all the things. If you've watched episodes in the past, you'll know that we cover a variety of topics, but the heart is really organizational change, helping people become leaders to help lead themselves and others through change. And I'm so excited because I have here with me my friend and expert in her space, Pooja Mehta. I'm going to read her bio for you, and then I'll let her introduce herself a little bit more. But Pooja Mehta is an independent consultant and leadership coach focused on providing talent management and HR solutions to firms of all sizes. Her background is rooted in process and operations improvement, people advisory services, and management consulting. And she has experience in a lot of different industries, including financial services, insurance, and healthcare. And she has supported the design, execution, and scaling of programs at various Fortune 500 firms, which I have had the privilege of experiencing right alongside her. Pooja is a birth doula and yoga instructor, and she lives in Morrison, Colorado with her husband and their dogs and enjoys getting outdoors in all seasons. That's Pooja in a nutshell, but Pooja, tell us a little bit more. Tell us your origin story, how you got to where you are today, and then, yeah, we'll go from there. Thanks, Jess. Thanks so much, and it's an honor to be here. Um, yeah, I I think my origin story really lies in my love for people, so my whole life, I have loved connecting with people, building relationships. And when you look back on your career, you often see more of a trend or a story than you're experiencing at the time where you're going with the best decisions. And each of the decisions I've made to move from Boston to Colorado to work in healthcare, to help people, to help mm -hmm. make things better, to go work in healthcare consulting, to get a better understanding of how our system works, to then come back to a people-centric organization focused on the people services side of things. All yeah. of that really came together to say, my whole goal is to help people. It's to make the yeah. human experience better. Um, it's why I'm called to do the birth doula work. It's why I'm called to do the yoga work. Um, yep. And it's why I want to help organizations better leverage their people and set them up for success. Yeah, absolutely. And today's topic too, and I should have mentioned this earlier, we're going to be talking about how to balance people and process. And they are, you know, being the two most important levers during change. So your whole story, your trajectory, it all makes sense to me. And I see that in who you are as a leader, as a consultant. And so I'm really excited we're going to have this conversation today. I have no doubt it's going to be informative to people who are listening to the Change Leader Insights community. So let's talk a little bit more about you know, how you can help people and just this idea of prioritizing people. And, and tell me a little bit more about what your thoughts are there. Yeah, absolutely. So when I've worked with companies in the past, both directly for the company and as a consultant, one of the things we talk about first is there are a lot of words for how we're calling our people. We call them mm -hmm. resources, human capital, mm -hmm. labor, but at the end of the day, they are people. And yeah. so when you first shift that mindset from, I have a resource I need to maximize productivity out of to, I have a human that I need to engage to help yeah. us with outcomes. You center back on that vision, that mission, that joint togetherness of, we are trying to go from point A to point B. And so prioritizing people is so critical because it gets you out of the mindset of, I have to achieve a goal and it's mm -hmm. we together have to achieve this mission, this overall mission, however that happens together. Yeah. Yeah. That makes so much sense. I think that's a really good reminder too, because it's easy to make decisions one way. If it's a resource on the other end, it's a lot there's more thought that goes into, I would imagine if you're making decisions and there's a human on the other side of that, it brings a, a different flavor and experience to that decision-making. So I love that you're encouraging people to think about that and how it brings it back to the mission vision. How do you move towards that end goal together? So now you've got this prioritizing people. Where does this process piece fit into? And again, within the context of organizations, growth, change, innovation, you need both. But this process piece, tell me a little bit more about your thoughts around how, if I'm a change leader, I'm a leader in an organization, or even just a, a member of a team, where does this process piece fit into the equation for you? Yeah, absolutely. So 
What I find really interesting and exciting about the process piece is people are problem solvers. People Mm -hmm. want to solve problems. And when in the past and historically, and even today, organizations come to their teams and say, we need you to get on board. This is our goal. It's sometimes, if you read about the neuroscience of leadership, it sometimes Mm -hmm. acts as a part of our human component that says, Mm -hmm. I'm going to push back on this. And it's not out Mm -hmm. of rebellion. It's because we're innately innovative. We want to create and problem solve as humans. And so when you think about the process, giving people the autonomy and the empowerment to say, I'm going to solve, I'm going to clarify this process. I'm going to solve this problem. I'm going to make it my own within, you know, within reason, obviously we can have these objectives to achieve. It allows people to feel like they are the captain of their own ship. It allows them to feel like I can move the needle forward. I have trust from my leader. I have autonomy to try something new to be creative here and solve a problem and still get to the same, if not a better end result. And so the process comes in with both how you approach people Mm -hmm. and the type of processes you are creating. Are they simple? Are they streamlined? Are they intuitive to people or are they overly complex because there's maybe some type or part of the process that you're used to doing that works a certain way, or it's Mm -hmm. tied to a system that would be a whole process in itself to overhaul. Um, When I think about how prioritizing people and process comes together, Mm -hmm. it's really one and the same in that if you want people to be engaged, you have to give them the loose leash, right? To allow them to explore different alternatives and feel like I am contributing. I am not just being told what to do in this process. That makes so much sense. And I think the way that you've said it, I haven't heard somebody on my show yet say it in that way. I mean, we talk about within the context of change management that people need a sense of ownership, but the way that you've articulated it and why we need to have our ability and autonomy to create our own process and a way forward is so important and how that also complements this idea of prioritizing people. And there's data around this too, that you were going to share. Can you tell us a little bit more about the, the data that kind of backs up what you're saying and reinforces this whole concept that clearly, you know, whether it's change management, innovation, process improvement, you know, people optimization, you know, how does, how does it all fit together with the data? Yeah, absolutely. So I actually would love to reference my own experiences with this. I think some of the work we did at DaVita, um, you know, overall, it's actually hard for industries to capture, oh, we did it this way. So we've seen X percent boost in, you know, engagement or retention. But our experience, you know, and I'll I'll reference DaVita since we worked there together, we were scaling a whole new program. We were designing it with nurses and tech, Mm -hmm. scaling that across clinics nationwide. And when we went into our first pilot clinics, we were telling them what to do and we were not yeah. getting adoption. The yep. moment we shifted, and I, I have to credit my, you know, my manager at the time, Pat, who who was yes. the, the real leader here, he said, let's design it with them. And we instead sat in a room with the nurses, with the doctors, with the techs, the social workers, the dietitians. We sat down and we said, what should this look like? What mm-hmm. process should we use? What system should we use? How many times should we meet? And we went through detail by detail, giving them really that empowerment of, you know this better than anyone else. You know what yep. the patient needs. We we started adopting that process pretty much the next week. There was yep. an excitement around meeting, about sharing information about patients. When we went to different clinics, we would bring those teammates with us to say, yes, this is what we did. We created it. We love yeah. this. This works for us. It's not something that corporate is just throwing down at us. And I think that, you know, that's better than any data point because it shows the actual impact that yeah. including people in the process, including people in the design of something can make them feel valued. It can make them yeah. feel their opinion and their voice matters and is making a difference. But it also ideally creates the best process because it's based on actual experience and yes. knowledge and not just this is my hypothesis based on you know industry benchmarks and and strategic insights right right but yeah so there's such a great example i'm really glad you shared that and i you know the funny thing is even in the work that i'm doing today or with guests who's been on the show i think many organizations still bump into 
the former, what you were describing before you and Pat went in there and said, let's design this with them. It's okay. I'm bringing this solution. It's a new piece of technology. It's a new process. It's based on industry benchmarks, all of those things. Why do you think that we haven't, you know, haven't, why is it so hard for us to, to make that leap in some cases in the workplace to actually co-create alongside um, the people that are going to be impacted by the, the changes, by the new ways of working? I think it's a really good question. And I have an idea of why I think that's the case. I don't know if anyone has the golden answer to that question, but I think it's because humans are creatures of habit. Yes. We're used to saying we're going to trust the system. We're going to trust the process. We're going to trust what experts say, right? Mm. And yeah. oftentimes when we hear feedback, we don't necessarily act on it in the way that seems the most obvious. And, and this mm. kind of relates back to prioritizing people and engaging them to drive those outcomes is mm-hmm. a lot of companies do these employee engagement surveys, right? where leaders will ask, give us your feedback. What do you need more of? And for an example, a lot of people will say, I need more work-life balance. Mm. What leaders might hear is, okay, great. At at 2 p.m. when we're all in the office, we're all going to go to happy hour or we're going to do this fun activity, Mm. which in theory sounds really fun, right? A break from your work. What happens then is that everyone's work piles up and you have to (laughs) go after work. You have to go home, maybe put your kids to bed, hang out with them. And then you have to do your work later at night. So does that actually impact your work-life balance positively? Maybe not. But how often do we see things in our culture, in our media that say connection is important, that improves work-life balance. Mm. The hours improves work-life balance because people feel more connected rather than just asking the people, what do you want? What do you need? It's actually easier. It saves time and money and it improves retention. But we're so used to let me see what other people do and just copy them instead yeah. of what do my people want? Yeah. Oh, I, that's a really insightful uh, observation and, and thought process there. I like that a lot. Well, okay. So um, kind of, kind of building on this, what else can, can engaging your people and giving them um, or prioritizing people rather, and giving them the ability to make those types of decisions through the processes that they are coming up with, what can that do for organizations? What can that do for employees um, who are working at those organizations that are trying to move the needle and grow and innovate like every organization is? Yeah. For me, I think that it's so important to give people the opportunity to level themselves up. Mm. So I think when you do this, you give people an opportunity to say, this is busy work. This is Mm -hmm. work that can be automated or done by someone who is more entry level. Mm -hmm. I want to focus on things that are going to challenge me and grow Mm -hmm. me and level me up. So for example, with AI and automation, you know, having been at the forefront for quite a while, but really taking, um, taking a step forward into the spotlight these days, a lot of people are worried about I might lose my job. And as as someone who's worked, you know, for a big four consulting firm where we did a lot of automation, I worked on a lot of automation. I think one of the perspectives we brought to organizations and that I continue to bring is this is not to reduce your workforce. This is to maximize your workforce. Yeah. When we automate the functions that are redundant or repetitive or not necessarily strategic, what that's doing is that's freeing up space for your great people to become even better and mm-hmm. give them the opportunity to say, as a director, I am no longer focused on doing all of these administrative items. I have someone or something that can do that mm-hmm. for me. I can now spend extra hours of time a week focused on developing strategy and being thoughtful about what we should be doing long-term and short-term to achieve our objectives, mm-hmm. to think about how is our team operating? How are our goals matched up as a team with the organization's goals? Are these the right marching orders that we have in mm-hmm. front of us? You start to think about team structure. How is my team structured? Are we maximizing people's strengths? Do we have 20 people reporting to one person? Can we have opportunities for spans and layers so that people have an ability to start to manage people and show mm-hmm. their ability to grow in that way as well? So I think that 
by prioritizing people, by prioritizing process, you're actually giving opportunities to your people to say, Mm -hmm. I'm going to free up some time. How do you want to spend it to grow and to learn? Yeah, I like that a lot. And it's such an interesting, you know, if you were to apply that to, and and you were talking about this a little bit uh, a moment ago, where you're saying, do the objectives are the things that we're working on, do they tie back to the broader strategy and goals? So when I think about, you know, change is an investment, change is strategy being executed, right? That's the whole, like, that's how the business innovates, grows, changes, um, so when you were talking about that, if, if we're saying let's prioritize people, let's prioritize process and we give them the target, right. Or we give them that end goal change that we want to make. It sounds like what you're saying is not only is their engagement going to be higher, but they're going to be able to actually spend the right, like their time focused on the right things, than doing all of the other things that kind of hold us back or, um, take up time that prevent us from actually being strategic and actually being able to execute. Is that, is that kind of what you're saying too? Absolutely. Yeah. And it it creates a more conducive environment too, for engagement, right? You don't have people who are upset or bored or annoyed at the type of work that they're doing because they know they can do more. You have people who are excited to come to work because they have challenges that they yeah. can innovate and solve towards that are not the same thing over and over again. Um, and so, yes, I, I think that that's exactly right. Yeah. What kind of barriers might exist to this model, this way of working and being that you're describing? Because, you know, a couple have come to mind just based on how people are. <laughs> but yeah. what are like, what have you seen or what, you know, what would you advise a client like, hey, here are the things you have to be thinking about in order for us to get to this ideal state, this might come up as part during the process. Like, do you foresee, or can you help people predict what those barriers might be? Yeah. I think we've talked about the human tendencies, right. Already. Mm -hmm. I think that those definitely exist. I actually would love to talk about technology and I know that you have a pretty wealthy tech background as well. So Mm -hmm. I think that this might resonate with you of our systems and our technology can often be a huge barrier of mm-hmm. we it's a it's a nice almost not excuse but it's a nice thing to say oh we can't do it because we use this or that technology mm-hmm. doesn't work in this way and yeah. i think when you encounter that barrier because it's inevitably going to come up with these bigger companies right we all have been using systems for a really long time that they get the job done. It may not be easy, but it works. And we know the loopholes mm-hmm. design the process from scratch again, right? Just as I was saying before and find the technology or work with that vendor to figure out how can we make this work more often than not, you know, I've worked with Workday before and more often than not, they're excited to innovate and find yeah. solutions that will fit your process because yeah, will often then carry on to other clients as well. Right. Um, Right. Most companies want to operate lean, efficient, give their people time back. When our systems or our technology get in the way of our processes, I have seen and observed that companies and leaders will often bend to that technology and, and right. think in the short term and say, that's going to be a huge investment and cost for resources. Let's just figure out loopholes for now, band-aid solutions instead of let's overhaul it. You know, let's figure right. out a way to do this right. It might take time, but that's okay because eventually we will get to where we need to be and it'll be better for everyone. It's almost like they're pot committed. They've already spent so much time and money and it's so pervasive, the loopholes and the different, you know, all the things. So it's scary to make that investment, but to your point, like it would take time up front and money, but then now you've got a process that works, that's more efficient, streamlined, lean, all of those things. So yeah, I think that's a really, I think that's a really good, uh, potential barrier that leaders need to be thinking about. And that's something that has more of a long tail. So in terms of an investment future strategy, you know, that's, that's really important to think about. What about, um, what else, you know, as we're talking about people and process and change, what else have you kind of run into or 
if you were to be meeting with a client, would you be advising them on, um, and you can bring up examples from the, you know, from the past or like what, what's, what does the future look like? Maybe we, since we're in December, this is going to be a December episode, 2024, as you're looking at 2025, what are some things that you'd be advising clients on in 2025? Yeah, absolutely. I think that a lot of the conversations I've been having with people this year in particular is, do I have the right people in the right roles? Yeah. Do I have the transparent understanding across my organization of what it looks like to be strong in this role and to be promoted into or move into a new role? And I think those skills, again, go back to that prioritization of people, but we, we really want to focus on what type of leader are you trying to create? What is the culture of leadership in your company today? What does that look like? What are the precedents that are set? And how, if at all, do you want to change that? So it's holistic with your strategic organizational goals because you're looking at where do I want to be as an organization and what kind of people and skills do I need to get there? If I have a five-year plan for improving the scale or breadth of my organization, my revenue, how am I going to achieve that? And who do I need on board in order to do that? Mm-hmm. And that impacts both skill, culture, it impacts what you're giving people as opportunities and how you are growing them and investing in them, both professionally and personally, right? We, we bring part right. of our personal lives to work every day. Yes. So that is a lot of the conversation I've been having um, is really identifying what are what are transparently you looking for as a leadership team to come Mm -hmm. out of the people that you have today? Do you have that potential in the group of people you have today? Or do you need to hire out for it? Do you need to invest in them to grow that potential to reach your goals? Um, Those are a lot of the conversations that we have been having is very future forward to your point about how do I get to where I need to go and who do I need to bring with me? Right. And I would imagine that you know, there's probably some level of uncertainty because of AI and automation and knowing five years out, I mean, that's a long horizon, right? With how quick um, technology is moving, but you have to, I mean, I, 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 we, there's a requirement to plan that far out, but also be able to pivot and adapt in a much shorter cycle because of the way that technology is advancing and the impact it can have on the skill requirements, the leadership aptitude, maybe. I think leadership is a enduring skill to develop, but um, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, Well, Pooja, this has been really informative and insightful. um, And I'm just glad that we had a chance to connect and talk about people, the importance of prioritizing people to engage them in the process, the importance of process and how when leaders bring people in and let them figure out the process in many ways, how that can accelerate goals, accelerate adoption and buy-in for making changes. It's such an important message for leaders to hear. Um, and I, this is one that I continually talk about with my own clients and people that are in, you know, that are listening, right? Like you have to bring people in and I love the way that you framed everything. Um, how can people find you if they would love, you know, if they want to connect with you and want to learn more about the services that you offer, what's the best place to get in touch? Absolutely. Yeah. I'm happy to share my contact information for now. We are working on a website uh, as a startup, as a new, new business, we're working on a website, but uh, for now, email is probably the best way or LinkedIn. So find me on LinkedIn um, or you can email me. I can give my email now, or I can send it to you later, but it's yeah. Send it to me and I'll put it. um, I think LinkedIn is probably is great for now. Pooja Meta on LinkedIn. And then um, I'll include that link in the in the promotion so people can connect with you that way. Great. That sounds perfect. Wonderful. Thank you so much for your time today. Really appreciate the conversation, Pooja. Yeah. Thank you so much for having me.